Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me. My name is Sam Henson. I'm the Director of Policy um, and Information at the at the National Government. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, for our what is our sixth in our series of webinars um, to date. So hopefully you, you've seen some of our others, um, but do do check them out on the website if you haven't. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about disadvantage and consideration for the board's response uh, in, in light, uh, to the wide entertainment gap in light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, I, I'm going to cover three key areas really in this webinar. Um, first of all, thinking about what disadvantage means, looking at the barriers faced um, as a result of uh, the, of COVID-19, and then coming back to the strategic response of governing boards in light of that. So um, first of all, thinking about disadvantage um, and, and what it means, I think it's worth starting off by saying that um, there, there have been quite a few voices across the sector and beyond that have questioned whether disadvantage is the right terminology, um, whether it's right and, and what sort of message does that give to our pupils, especially those that fall within um, the, the disadvantaged category. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's a good point and one that we, we need to carry on debating. But I think for the sake of today, we'll be using that term. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that when we're talking about disadvantage, um, the, 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 the poorest children's society, society are already 11 months behind their better off peers, even before they start at school life. So disadvantage and, and the way we're looking at it today is something that, that isn't really just about um, school life. We're, uh, it's before and it's after. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to specifically think about the role of schools uh, in help, helping to tackle that. The focus on pupil premium has um, potentially quietened down um, a little bit over the last year or so. But... Um, uh, all of a sudden, we're all finding that uh, lots and lots of people are starting to once again talk about the focus on the attainment gap uh, and thinking about what we need to be doing in light of COVID-19. And the focus on the gap is going to become very prominent. Again, of that, I have absolutely no doubt, as there's an awareness of the unequal consequences of COVID-19 on our pupils. Now, even before the pandemic, there was uh, a degree of concern that more children were starting to suffer uh, under a, an increased weight of poverty. And there's uh, evidence um, from the Education Policy Institute that indicates that the gap had stopped closing in recent years and will start potentially start to, to grow again uh, as a result of COVID-19. Now, the disadvantage gap as measured by the disadvantage gap index was 3.70 in 2019 now that's nine percent lower than in 2011 when it was 4.07 but it has risen slightly for the second year in a row from 3.66 to 3.68 in 2017 and from 3.68 um, uh, to 3.70 uh, in 2019 so the the um, education policy institute has de defined the persistent disadvantage as those who have been eligible for free school meals for at least 80% of their time at school, indicating that they have lived in households with little or no employment income, um, not just temporarily, but long-term. So you'll see on this slide here, we've got um, the, the definition um, from the department, um, but there are, there are different definitions around there, around uh, uh, what, what, what disadvantage looks like and what we mean by that. Um, so thinking about the impact of poverty more widely on, on pupils and their learning, um, the, there's, there's also different measures of, of poverty. Um, so it kind of makes the, the picture even more uh, confusing for, for us all. The UN described poverty as not being able to afford the basic needs of life itself. The Social Metrics Commission uh, defines poverty as a, a family that has 54 uh, percent or less of what the median family has. Uh, so there's different different ways of looking at poverty. What we what we all know is that poverty um, for, uh, affects 
uh, families and individuals hugely and it affects education hugely. Um, so I think one of the questions uh, that people ask is why does poverty have such an impact on, on education and attainment? And um, I've put here uh, some of the combined in, in, in impacts really. As, as you see, these different things come together um, and it has that impact on, on today uh, uh, throughout schooling and then as pupils uh, leave school as well. So a huge impact, not, on, uh, not just on, on pupils when they're at school, but as they carry on um, in, in, uh, uh, as they go, as they leave school as well. Um, so we know that many commentators have said that child poverty is on the rise in the UK with rising costs of living, low wages, etc. And this was all before um, the pandemic uh, started. And um, we also know that um, for, for those uh, pupils deemed to be in poverty, almost two thirds of children living in poverty have at least one parent in work. So for many, work, is, is, work simply isn't paying enough for parents to provide for their children. So there's lots of things that we need to take into account as we talk about disadvantage uh, uh, more widely uh, uh, as well. So thinking about this then, um, NGA has been thinking about what disadvantage means, what poverty means, um, for our pupils for, for a long time and though many of you um, will hopefully remember that a few years ago we started our spotlight on disadvantage campaign and uh, we did some research out of that and um, really the aim of that research was to raise outcomes, to raise knowledge, to raise awareness, to, to think about the role of governing boards as well in, in terms of their role of, of disadvantage as well. Um, thinking about how, how do governing boards begin to process this all at a local level. Now that challenge is obviously bigger now uh, than ever and will continue. Um, uh, clearly at school itself isn't just about providing children with an education. Um, school has, has a much wider role in society and I think now more than ever our pupils will be noticing uh, just just how big a role school can play in, in lives beyond simple education. So I think it's really helpful when we're thinking about um, the, the partial closures of school, the impact on our disadvantaged pupils. It's important that we think about it, not just in terms of uh, learning and teaching and attainment, it's that we think about it in terms of all the other things that school is to our pupils as well. Um, the pupil premium shouldn't only focus directly on teaching and learning, and that's one of the, the reoccurring themes of this webinar today. Something that, that NGA has been quite vocal about, something that we've talked about in our research previously. But lots of uh, schools um, and, and other commentators have aimed um, pupil premium very much at teaching and learning in the past, and, and that's totally understandable. Um, but one of the things I really want to do today is to think about some of the wider um, uses of pupil premium um, to address the current um, issue, the current uh, situation that so many people are facing and, 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 and thinking about what are the extra considerations we need to be thinking about going forwards. So um, I've got here a slide on um, the immediate impact of disadvantage and what, what does that look like? Um, now, obviously, I'm sure we'll have lots of different um, different uh, things that we can we can talk about in a local context around the immediate impact of COVID-19 on, on our schools, but also on our disadvantaged pupils. Um, as the realities of COVID-19 hit uh, every part of society, some corners of society will, will essentially get hit the hardest. And the, the response um, from schools, the response from governing boards needs to be considered in, in two phases. Interventions during the period now when schools are partially closed and then interventions for when schools fully resume. So students from disadvantaged backgrounds are already twice as likely to leave formal education without GCSEs in English and maths compared to their better off classmates. And time away from school, for example, through uh, school holidays. We, we, we know this because of 
evidence taken from school holidays only goes to widen the gap through the learning loss. So there's a big, big concern about what this current um, gap in schooling means for so many disadvantaged pupils. It's also about being acutely aware of how all aspects of life impact upon families and pupils. School life lately has looked very different um, or been non-existent for many disadvantaged pupils. And as we return to um, a, a, a more normal way of life, schools will face a host of, of new and immediate challenges that go way beyond the lack of um, a simple access to learning, which, which we're dealing with at the moment. There will be increased cases of bereavement, neglect and anxiety for, for many pupils. And um, the Sutton Trust has done some research that's found that, that just over a third, 34% of parents with children aged between five and 16 have reported that their child does not have access to their own computer, laptop or tablet. Um, and that's an estimated 60,000 children in the UK lack any internet connectivity at home uh, with 700,000 who lack uh, the, um, the equipment um, uh, to access the internet as well for a laptop desktop or, or laptop uh, a tablet even um so we 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 need to be thinking about this both in terms of that immediate access to learning point but also the the wider experiences uh, and, and what that looks like for so many uh, uh pupils uh, ac across the country right now pupils from middle class homes are much more likely to have taken part in online uh, learning, 30% doing so at least once a day, compared to 16% of working class pupils. And there is also um, going to be a real challenge with attendance going forwards as schools start to open the doors to more pupils as well. That stay at home message has been taken very, very seriously by parents uh, 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 across all corners of society and there are lots of children as well will, will simply potentially not want to return to school or feel unsafe doing so. And so these these issues are all combined to, to create really what is that, that kind of perfect storm, if you like. The uh, Association for Directors of, of Children's Services has said that they think it, it, it will take at least five to six weeks for schools to, to sufficiently plan um, to to get plans in place for our disadvantaged pupils as they return to school. So there's some real big considerations for us here. And then thinking about COVID-19 and the impact, uh, the long-term impact on disadvantage, I think that's it, it's a slightly different conversation, but also one that we need to have. We will all be very aware that this week, um, we've all been reading stories about the, the, the way the economy has started to really, really, really suffer as a result of the current situation. That sharp economic downturn will undoubtedly push more children onto the poverty line. Our disadvantaged pupils are uh, on the cusp of a whole heap of new uh, barriers. And the reality is that schools will need extra resources just as the country's uh, budget faces a monumental challenge. So, uh, you know, th this is the, something that I'm sure all of us are, are starting to think about. Um, Bernardo's have, have suggested that the worst is yet to come. They talked about the massive risk of hidden children. So those um, those peoples that, that, that weren't classed as disadvantaged before COVID-19, that um, as a result of the pandemic will be pushed into uh, uh, the poverty line. So I think that's something that as governing boards, we need to be thinking about that when, when we go, uh, uh, when school starts to, to return to some form of normality. One of the consequences of, um, of COVID-19 is a lot more people have been claiming universal credit, so uh, eligible for free school meals. Um, there may well be long-term um, implications around the monitoring and accountability process. We don't know yet. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, but what we do know is there are big changes for, 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 for all of us going forward. Um, I think as well, it's worth saying here that Today, a lot of the focus um, from the government has been on vulnerable pupils and a lot of our disadvantaged pupils won't necessarily fall into that category. And so we, we are waiting on a lot more information coming out uh, in, in the coming weeks and months on, um, on how, we, how we even begin to uh, 
uh, unpick this and address uh, the, the situation for our disadvantaged pupils. Um, so there is going to be a need for us to really be thinking about this um, on a frequent basis going forwards. So I've included here a slide which um, kind of rather uh, in a slightly messy fashion um, has put together a whole host of um, uh, voices from across the sector and beyond on um, what uh, on how the sector can respond, particularly in, uh, in terms of our disadvantaged pupils. You'll see there's lots of different suggestions. Um, and um, you know, throughout the education theory and, and across the political spectrum, the attainment gap between the rich and the poor is is under the spotlight in in a big way. And there is a growing sense that COVID-19 will have serious long-term re repercussions for for most of our disadvantaged peoples, as you can see from these comments. So I've um, got a poll here, um, which I'm just going to hopefully. Um, release now. Okay, so I'm going to launch this poll. Um, really, just to get your views, if you've, if you've got a minute, I'm going to leave this open for a minute, just to get your views on, on which of these suggestions, I've limited it to five, which do you think is most important? Which, which, which of these would, would really be something that you think will make a big difference um, going forward. So just whilst you all um, have a chance to vote on that, um, there have been calls for uh, a, 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 an increase in the, the commissioning of research into the exact implications of COVID-19 on our disadvantaged people. So we will see more uh, more of that coming out in in the in the in in the weeks and months to come. Um, so this this webinar comes at a time when really um, there's lots of voices out there commenting on it, but actually in terms of evidence, you know, that will be emerging in the weeks and months to come. So I think from the governing board's perspective, it's really important that now, perhaps more than ever, we look to that national perspective uh, and, and thinking about that um, in terms of our disadvantaged pupils. Right, so I'm going to close this poll um, now. and. I think I'm sharing the poll. Hopefully you can all see that. So 36% think the most important thing, this is really interesting. So 36% think the most important thing is the fundamental change in central policy itself, um, uh, which I think, you know, there's been lots and lots of um, thought on this. And I think that's, that's, that's a really powerful message that we can take forward and share um, not just with the DfE, but the sector as a whole. 27% uh, think the weight of school funding increased towards disadvantage. Um, I think uh, it's interesting that just 9% think of doubling the pupil premium for specific year groups, um, which is something that the um, Education Policy Institute have recommended, and only 12% think uh, summer school provision. So that's um, really, really useful. Thank you. I'm going to... Um, hide that now okay so um let's move on so um the immediate um uh, emphasis for us as governing boards is really uh, as you know very much going to be on what can we do um uh, within our strategic role um and there's going to be certain things that we're all going to want to be focusing on i'm sure um, that, that is very much rooted in our own local context. I'm sure many of us have already um, been having conversations with our head teachers, our executive leaders on on what what do we know about the impact so far on our disadvantaged pupils. Um, we're all, we're obviously going to need to be having that focus on that ongoing support for home study, which is absolutely key now. Um, you know, uh, uh, but also um, thinking about as as the doors to our schools start to open to more pupils. How will the challenges shift going forwards? Schools will face difficulties resulting from the pandemic that, that in reality will in, endure for years to come. And they will need support as they step up to meet those challenges. And the governing boards need uh, a, a two-fold approach. Firstly, um, to ramp up the, those discussions, those, that strategic discussion around efforts to challenge disadvantage 
with a likely increase in the numbers of pupils falling into that category and secondly to work with our executive leaders to address the impact of lockdown experiences themselves and I think we have to come back to that you know that those experiences will will vary drastically uh, some actually will, will, will come back to school and you know they might even have, have, have enjoyed lockdown others would have had the worst time ever um, so the the the, the the lockdown experiences of our that our disadvantaged pupils have faced will, will vary and um, all of this needs to form part of our wider discussion on how do we begin to optimize the current situation for the good of all pupils and their learning um, so i think that's going to be uh, really really challenging going forwards even if even if we're not uh, uh, it had those conversations yet I think this this steers us in, in a, a good place for starting to think about this uh, one of the things um, that was on the poll actually that that you may well be starting to think about now is around summer provision now this is a, a, de a quite a highly debated topic at the moment firstly whether um, any any form of summer provision um, at all not just for our disadvantaged pupils um, is right um, and, and if it is right, what should the focus be on? Um, the, the, there is a, a possible possible exploration around this that the, it could be used as as catch up education for disadvantaged pupils. But I think it's worth thinking about this uh, in, in, in quite a lot of depth because it's not going to be a one size fits all approach. And many people, their view is that there should be it's not something that we should even entertain. Um, but the, the, it's definitely something that is helpful for us as the governing boards within our strategic conversations and our strategic planning to be thinking about, uh, you know, does the summer present any opportunity um, uh, to, to, to provide some provision for our disadvantaged pupils uh, or not? Now, I think just to, to throw this into the mix, um, Paul Whiteman from NAHT, um, was giving evidence to the Education Select Committee just this week. One of the things he said was that um, the autumn term will present um, a, a real challenge for the amount of learning that needs to take place. Certainly his view was he was very wary of, of um, tiring out pupils and, and, and indeed teachers before the term starts. So there's lots of things to consider there. Um, but coming back to the wider strategic discussion, um, governors, the governor's perspective needs to be about knowing the context and the demographics of the school and what do we want for the outcomes of our pupil premium uh, to be at this, at this point in time. And governors should be guided, as they always are, by, by their vision and their values. So that, that strategic role um, in terms of disadvantage is rooted in exactly the same thing that we, that we come back to. Um, but I think there's a big question mark here about uh, actually how inclusive is our vision and you know it is how does the, our approach to disadvantage fit with that and I think that's a, a really key thing you know now is a time to let our our vision and our values and our ethos really shine um, and uh, you know th that means taking that holistic approach to to disadvantage that that nurturing um, mentoring approach and it's not really just about having disadvantage as an agenda item it's more about looking at every every decision made through the lens of disadvantage and ensuring that the needs of disadvantaged pupils are taken into consideration and then acted upon so just moving that conversation forward I'm picking some of the barriers um, I, what I just want to focus on here is this this point around having a considered a considered approach and as part of our considered approach we need to continue uh, our assessment of, of what the the situation is for our disadvantaged peoples and it might take uh, a fair bit of time to identify who has fallen behind and to then agree a plan going forwards how would a school know if personal circumstances have changed um, uh, uh, for example the loss of a job um, uh, for, for a parent you know uh, and how do we how do we then even begin to um, target that intensive support needed uh, in the short term and then thinking about the longer approaches that we need to look at as well so huge challenges for us all the view out there is that the uh, one of the views out there is that monitoring 
um, should not involve an increase in the number of exam condition tests because pupils will already be under uh, a, a degree of stress. So that's, that's certainly a, a view that I've heard shared a lot in terms of our uh, our approach to to assessing the situation for our disadvantaged pupils. Um, NFER have uh, got some really helpful resources which you can go and, and, and look at. They've given um, done some research prior to the COVID-19 situation, but much of that still stands the, the test really. Um, um, uh, well, one of the things that NFER have suggested is um, looking at the seven features, um, uh, we, we, uh, seven features of schools which have raised attainment in the past. And those features are a whole school ethos of attainment for all, addressing behavior and attendance, high quality teaching for all, meeting the individual, individual needs, um, uh, deploying staff effectively, um, data-driven and responding to evidence and a clear responsive approach to leadership. So I think that's quite a helpful way of looking at that. Okay, so um, this slide here is really just about um, our pupil premium strategy itself and our pupil premium planning, thinking about what that, that looks like and what we need to be doing with that going forwards. It's important that governing boards understand the barriers facing our schools um, and we are forming our strategy around that and that emphasis on strategy it includes a, a multiple years really so many of us were familiar previously with the, the pupil premium plans and um, we tend to focus on that that one year point but the pupil premium strategy thinking about three years and obviously that's that's a challenge in itself at the moment but you will see here this kind of raises the that operational strategic divide question uh, as well. Now, there's going to be some real sensitivities here, I think, for all of us and how we approach that, um, thinking about how do we work with our leaders but not tread on their toes at this time. And um, I, I, I think the, 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 the key there is having that, that discussion um, with, with our leaders themselves, bearing in mind that actually they need space to be able to test things, they need space to research, they need space um, to find out what what is being said at both a national, uh, regional, local level, um, and we need to support our leaders in doing that. So now is a good time, I think, to reflect on the basics of what um, what this all means in practice for the governing board working with our senior leaders. Schools need to understand how those barriers have changed and leaders need time to, to figure that out, uh, to inform us of that. And that means spending time exploring uh, whatever is out there. And the pupil premium strategy written by school staff but approved by the governing board will need to be rooted in the context of the times and circumstances. And the times and the circumstances are very different now perhaps to when our pupil premium strategy was put together. Um, so we need to think about that. We also need to reflect how how measurable and time bound is, is our strategy and, and how how relevant is it now, uh, thinking about that? Now, I think it's worth saying here at this point, the COVID-19 situation does all of a sudden mean all of our uh, interventions and, and initiatives are suddenly redundant. No, actually lots of them, uh, the vast majority of them, I'm sure will be just as relevant and, and uh, actually it might just be a case we need to ramp them up. Um, but equally, I think it's, it's important that we, we are open to, to new things and thinking about um, uh, the, the timelines we previously set uh, that you know we will we will obviously need to review some of those going forwards. So this slide um, really looks at the kind of circle of pupil premium planning and 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 strategy, thinking about all of the um, interventions in the middle here. But also, I think my main point here is just linking it back to the whole vision and values and ethos discussion. I think that's really important. The pupil premium strategy needs to work alongside the wider school improvement strategy, which will also need to be reviewed, but both should be heavily rooted in the school's vision and values. And as the sector questions how it should respond in the long term, boards should look at how inclusive their vision is and how it works alongside so many of the issues that will be raised in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I think that that's key. Um, I'm going to move on for the sake of time. Once again, gone over, so I apologise apologize for that. Um, now more than ever, I think we're going to need and want to think outside the box because the box that was is um, 
uh, you know, uh, slightly, um, the, well, the picture's changed, I guess, is what I'm trying to say in a very rambly way that doesn't help with my, my lack of timekeeping. Um, but nobody knows what the new normal will look like. And um, some of the challenges for remote learning during COVID have highlighted the barriers facing disadvantaged pupils outside the classroom and the implications for learning. And so if poverty is going to increase during the uh, an econo an economic downturn, then this uh, discussion at a governing board level is more relevant and important than ever. Um, so we really need to be thinking about this. Oh, just realizing that I didn't actually have any of those points up there. Um, so you've got the popular initiatives there, um, but we also need to be thinking outside the box, looking at other board considerations, which is really key. Thinking about um, uh, things that perhaps we haven't thought about before um, and, and thinking about how we review that as well. So we don't know um, what things will look like. There will be a huge temptation to throw everything at teaching and learning. Um, but I think now more than ever, local intelligence is key and the role of uh, linking what we're doing with the needs of the community and reflecting on the experience of the community is also key. It's worth saying that parental engagement is going to be a crucial tool for us in uh, addressing the needs of our disadvantaged pupils. And I know that's a challenge because many of us uh, in, in our local context have tried to engage with pupils and our leaders have tried to do it and it, and it has not, it doesn't all, not always proven to be easy. But I think the role of, of parent engagement again will be more important than ever so we need to perhaps think about how what can we do differently um, to, to approach that it's important that boards and leaders stop to consider the evidence to inform the right approach and governing boards need to look to distribute pupil premium more evenly than ever before and that really means thinking about pastoral needs uh, and engagement not just teaching and learning i think in in the past there's been a tendency to throw everything at teaching and learning, but actually we, we will need to be thinking about those wider experiences of, of our uh, disadvantaged uh, pupils, thinking about that and that pastoral, uh, that, that supportive role that, that, that pupils are, are going to need to overcome the increase in social, emotional and health issues um, that will undoubtedly go on to impact on the pupils' learning. So we actually, it's important that we address those as well. As well. So um, just as I finish, I've got um, just some points here around board discussion going forwards and what, what we can start to think about in terms of our agendas and those questions we can be asking. Planning for interventions, the catch up in schools restart such as catch up sessions and this should be planned prior to school return where possible. I'm sure many of you, I know many of you, are continuing your, your governing board's meetings uh, uh, online virtually. So um, ha make sure we allow space on the agenda for that. Um, that drive to increase attendance is going to be really important uh, going forward. So there needs to be a clear, uh, distinct message. And, that, and also our schools are, are able and given space to be active in reaching out to parents, uh, you know, which will be a, a huge, huge challenge. Um, I'm sure, and schools need to have that opportunity and that capacity to serve a wider range of people should uh, uh, to, to reduce the gap. Um, we also need to be thinking about those families whose socio-economic situations may have changed or worsened, and thinking about how how we how we um, actually engage in that conversation. A delicate, difficult conversation. Not all parents are happy to kind of be upfront about that, and and. And, and not all pupils are either. So that's going to be a, a real challenge as well. Um, we've got a point there around the curriculum. Um, I did a, a whole webinar on the curriculum um, a couple of weeks ago. So do, do have a look at that for more uh, information on, on that as well. Um, my last slide really, I wanted to end on a word of optimism. Um, improving the support for families during the pandemic Using you know, is going to be a huge um, priority uh, for all of us right now. And we can use the school as a community hub for that. Uh, and, and I think it's really key. I know I keep saying this, but it's really key that we keep referring back to the experiences of our community and local intelligence at this 
point in time. The success of the pupil premium in closing the attainment gap is reliant on schools to make the best choices given their characteristics and circumstances. And those circumstances look very different now to how they did um, before. Addressing the attainment gap created by COVID-19 is clearly, clearly a huge and daunting task for, for everyone. But this is potentially a, a unique opportunity to, to look at our, uh, our, our approach locally, to look at our approach nationally as well, and, and, and to think about how we can make a real difference. And I'm sure we will all be thinking about how we can, we can uh, approach that. Um, it's also worth remembering that the, 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 the lockdown experience will be very different for different pupils and not everyone um, will view it as a negative and there has been some powerful learning experiences at home for them. Um, so thinking about um, actually has, has there been any learning that's worked in, in the favour of that disadvantaged pupils and can we learn from anything? Now more than ever I think our country will require uh, monumental efforts across government, business and the education sector to ensure that progress is, is not lost. So, so I think, you know, actually let's where momentum has been built, we can, we can carry that on. Um, but this is a long term challenge which requires a strategy. And that's where us as governors, we have such a clear role in living our values, uh, uh, being clear and upfront about our values, our ethos, our vision. Um, and and actually building this into that there there's no short-term fixes here so um thank you so much for for joining joining me on on this um this uh, webinar um i've totally gone over to, over time um what what i would love to do is any of you that have got any questions i'd really like to engage with you um directly via email so do do send the questions in to us um and it might be you've got thoughts you've got ideas uh, we'd love to share them with people as well so do get in touch with that but um thank you so much i hope you're all um staying well hope you all soon and um yeah speak to you speak to you soon hopefully